Okay, so real quick, I want to do a video going over the idea of sequential logic and just kind of explain what that is and what we're gonna do with it. So, let's go on hopping over, take a look. All right, so real quick, back to the roadmap. Everything we've done so far has led us up to the ALU. We've gone from NAND, building some gates, a little extraction, elementary logic gates, build some chips, it's more abstraction and then culminated in the ALU. That's what we finished in chapter two. Now we're moving to creating RAM. And it's not gonna be just RAM. So a lot of other components that are very critical once we get to this point right here. But the main large chip, I suppose, similar to the ALU is going to be the RAM of the system. Now, in Computer science, we have a very, very common theme where we'll start with some simple model and use that to create a more complex system. We've done this very similar with logic gates. So we started with NAND, move that up to say MUXs, got up to the ALU, and just kind of continued on where we start with something very, very simple and scale it up and design a complexity over and over. So that's a very common theme that you're going to see. Now, while this is very useful, you'll see where there's some limitations. What this simple model we've done so far, what we have created, everything is in the form of combinational logic. So during the course of chapter one, we develop logic for logic gates, ands, ors, muxes, demuxes, and then some very complex ones like demux eight way, mux four way sixteens, stuff like that. Moving on to chapter two, we extend that even further by introducing the aspect of arithmetic. So we had stuff like adders, and then culminate that into the ALU. So while the ALU that we create is very very simple it's still a fairly elegant design thanks to the idea of two's complement and then basic boolean logic so even though we only created addition and by proxy earlier logical and and whatnot we can derive several different operations based on that simple model so you see this theme continue on now while the setup that we have right now is fairly clever. It has some genuine drawbacks. We can compute, again, various different types of operations on a fixed number of inputs. So and 16 that takes in two values, and them together. Dmux eight way takes in one value and splits it out eight different ways. Add 16 takes two values, adds them together. And ALU takes in two values and some function and does an operation however this exists kind of in a vacuum we can't make a system out of this at least not a very well functioning one because we cannot do this for a dynamic number of inputs this is supposed to be two my bad so what we do is create the idea of sequential logic and that takes time into consideration. So our current gates are completely time independent. But we can get around that fairly simple. The goal is to, let's say if we had, do an and real quick. This is the general kind of thought process of what and is. You take in some value, and them together, you get a value out. Well, what if we were able to do something like this? You have the output of the gate pass back to the input. And with and, this is really terrible, but that concept would be very critical in creating sequential logic, eventually up to RAM and several other things in just a bit. Now, in the software aspect of sequential logic, 
it gives us the ability to store data. We have examples of x equals 17 and i equals 0. We can store data in RAM, which is what we create RAM using sequential logic. It's the ability to store data in our system. And it also allows us the ability to solve things through the process of loops and recursion and a lot of the stuff that takes like a course of time. And this the idea of looping is going to be the same thing of looping a gate back into itself. Stuff like that. Now, for hardware, if we were using genuine hardware, because what we're doing right now is simulated software that simulates hardware, we would need to take the actual physical hardware delays into consideration when we move data from one chip to another. If you look over here on the left, we have a PCB, a bunch of different traces, and a different various components on the board. Now, as data travels through these traces, it takes time. It might be extremely fast for us as humans, but for a computer, the longer those traces get, the more unstable the system is going to become. And you can take a look over here on the right at this motherboard. It's a really good example of that because there's a lot of complex hardware going on. Here we have CPU. We've got some PCIe lanes down here. We have our actual RAM slots here. And one good example, if you take this CPU into consideration, the RAM slots that are further away from the CPU genuinely have a very, very fractional amount of degraded performance due to that distance. That's the way that we have everything set up is because we're trying to minimize the degradation of performance and stability by enforcing this kind of this common standard. But if we were to continue to move them further over, you would start to see some inconsistencies in the system due to data not being able to move from one point to another quick enough. And it happens here in the PCIe lanes as well. That's why you see common standards in motherboards pretty frequently. Now, the idea of discrete time is what we're looking for. So set time cycle slightly greater than maximum delay. Use outputs only at the end of a cycle. Ignore any changes between. If we look at it, we have a clock that has some tick-tock cycle in it. So it's just this common cycle that's going to happen at some frequency over and over and over again. We have different cycle lengths here. And then we have different time steps. So this is the first one, second one, three, four, five. And it's going to continue over and over and over again. And that gives us the concept of time. Now, what it means of use outputs only at end of cycles, you only look at the outputs and then puts everything at the end of these different clock cycles. If something happens in between here, it doesn't matter. Completely ignore it because if we try to look at the input and outputs at all given times, it would create an extremely unstable system because you cannot actually define when data is going to arrive at some point. So it might work, it'll just work really bad. So this is kind of the ideal. We have some physical time that is continuing on. Clock cycles, the tick tocks of one zeros, just the actual cycle steps you're on. Time steps here, one, two, three, four, five, it'll continue on as long as this clock is going. Then we have our input, one or zero, and our output. And currently we are doing example of a not gate right here. So Discrete time track state changes only when advancing from one time step to another. So the ideal here is during this time step, it's an input of one, we can output a zero. And here we flip down to zero, the not gate gives us a one. And you can see it just tracks perfectly. However, this is not what reality is. This is more of what we see in reality. You can tell that there is a slight time delay 
whenever you're going from say the zero input up to this one. And let's say that if this happened, I like here, where we're transitioning this zero to one, and it happens in between time cycles, well, that can cause some pretty serious issues if the inputs have not properly settled. So, this is a pretty obvious one down here as well. Or the behavior of our hardware is not always guaranteed to be exactly what we want. So we can cause these limitations in discrete time by only focusing at the end of clock cycles as opposed to during everything between. So if we just point this one, this one, this and this, this and this, and continue on and so forth, then you end up with this type of system. The time delays still exist, but we just ignore the data transformations happening in between clock cycles and just look, hey, what is the data at the end? We might have expected it to change before, but if it didn't get there in time, then we just ignore it and treat it as if though it just kind of was a little bit slow to get there. This gives us the idea of discrete time, which gives us this actual pretty solid foundation to work with. So, everything in sequential logic is going to be thanks to this component right here called a data flip-flop. Now, in actual hardware, there are many types of flip-flops, SR latches, stuff like that that is dealt with at a very low level to generate a clock signal. Ours, I'll explain in a second, but it is extremely simplified because dealing with sequential logic and hardware is very, very complex. Now, ours is simulated, so it's going to work perfectly every single time. It's kind of like in a physics class where you just ignore air friction and stuff like that because it makes the equations work better and look nice and simplifies the entire experience. That's kind of what we're doing here. So, start with the data flip-flop. We move up to a one-bit register. Then we clap a bunch of those together. We get a multi-bit register. Put a bunch of those together. And we get RAM. You see we have RAM in here. So that's going to get scaled up as well. So essentially you start at one point, scale it up, scale that up, scale that up, and then it's going to be a continuous cycle. Now, data flip-flop, also known as a latch. The most elementary sequential gate outputs the input in the previous time step. So it's not transforming the data. It's just taking the data and putting this exact same thing out at the next time cycle. So an example will be here, so we have just arbitrary input, so 1 or 0. And notice that this output, nothing really exists, because we can't determine what's being put out from the DFF. Assume there's something there, but we just ignore it for the time being because we haven't started the actual clock cycle. So it's just kind of a little bit of delay there. But we really start looking at it in the actual time step of 2. So. The input of the DFF is 1, so we output a 1 for that time cycle. Next one, the input is 0, the next step is 0, still 0, so the next step is 0, still 0, so the next step is 0, then we swap up to 1, so it outputs a 1, back down to 0, and back down to 0, and it's just kindly just continuously outputting whatever it was. But this is the idea that gives us a loop. So we have the ability to track time. By itself, it's really not that useful. However, if we create a register from it, we'll discover how to do that in the next video, then we have the idea of loading and storing data. Now, we take a look at it, we have some 16-bit value input. They're using 17 here, so it's assume 17. There is a select pin in the form of a mux here on whether we are going to load or store data, kind of like a true or false value. And then we have some output. And again, it's just using kind of a DFF. There's no actual combination of 
data here. So it's going to output it. Now, for every time step, while we are loading data, let's say one, that means we're loading in this value of 17. And then we switch that to zero, which gives us the concept of storing data. Every time step afterward, it's going to continuously cycle that 17 over and over again until this 205th time step. So a lot of time has passed here. We're going to say, hey, I want to load new data. We would pass in value 21 here. And now all of a sudden, the output changes to 21. And then we swap back to storing it. So we have the ability to freely store data for as long as we want or load in new data and change it at any given point that we would like to and then swap to storing that. So we'll get to the more intricate aspects of how this particularly works in the next video where I go over all the different gates starting at the one bit register right on the last slide and move up to a bunch of other different things culminating in the more complex RAM. But that's pretty much it for me. Hopefully this all made sense. Hopefully you learned something. I'll see you in the next video.